Okay, so the next speaker is uh, Richard Gee Briggs. He's been involved in uh, Linux security for, what, 20 years <laughs> or so? Almost. Uh, I first met Richard, uh, he was back in the uh, late 90s, he was working on the Free Swan project and I started doing some development on that. Uh, that was before we could have uh, IPsec in the, in the kernel due to the, the uh, first round of uh, crypto wars. Um, and that's how I actually got started in, in Linux kernel development uh, through that project. Uh, so uh, Richard is here to talk about uh, audit and namespaces and containers. Well, this is encouraging. I was figuring that uh, the way to clear the room was to announce a uh, talk about audit. Um, all right, so um, I've been, whoops, don't want that kick, oh dear. Excuse me. I guess I'll have to talk for less than five minutes on each slide. So, a uh, bit of history, um, I started um, hacking on computers back in the late 70s, and uh, I guess there's been sort of a steady progression ever since. Um, there's most of the, most of the history there. Um, exposure to uh, PDP 11.23, uh, started doing some real programming, um, then got some education, um, well, got some schooling, shall I say. The education came later. Um, then, uh, as uh, uh, James mentioned, uh, worked on FreeSwan, and uh, then worked on some imager drivers for security uh, cameras, in fact. And uh, then I've been working with Red Hat uh, for three and a half years now. So I'm known uh, in other places as Sunracer from some of my um, solar car racing and uh, RGB on IRC. And uh, more recently as a uh, diplomatic dependent. And so that will explain uh, why I might yawn during the talk because I'm still somewhere over the Atlantic in terms of debt lag. Um, yeah. So what is audit? Well, it was introduced by Rick Faith in uh, 2004, uh, who was a red hatter. Um, came in in uh, just about the time that the kernel started uh, actually using Git um, and that the logs were, were kept. Um, what is it? It's more or less uh, syslog on steroids. Um, syslog has a lot of uh, functionality that's um, used for monitoring what's going on and uh, a lot of it's used for debugging. Um, audits point is more to uh, securely document what's going on so that if something bad happens, you can go back and potentially use these logs in a court of law to be able to say, uh, okay, well, this happened at this point and this particular person did that and whatnot. Um, it works well with SE Linux and with other um, uh, security modules in the kernel. Uh, and the point was to be able to have it be able to report stuff that's going on, um, actions that have been taken place on part of some of the other uh, security uh, tools. Um, there's, a, there's a user space daemon which uh, logs to disk or to net. Um, so there are events that are generated in the kernel itself which are reported, but there's also events generated by various different user space tools and uh, they will contact the kernel and queue things and um, um, yeah. So there are configurable kernel filters so that you can select what you actually want to see or be able to see more detail on something or ignore others. Uh, it only reports behavior. It doesn't actually interfere actively with what's going on in the running system with the exception of uh, if you've got uh, some situation where it's not able to document or report what's going on, then you can set things up to be able to actually panic the kernel and stop it. So what are namespaces? Uh, they were first introduced, uh, sorry, I'll back up a second. Um, namespaces are kernel-enforced user space views. So. 
uh, it's, able to, it's possible to set things up so that from a set of namespaces, you've got a limited view from, the, from user space of what's actually going on on the system. And uh, this is uh, set up so that um, you could have um, various different uh, processes compartmentalized and uh, they are not able to see beyond their, their own scope. So at the moment, there are seven different namespaces. We've got peer namespaces, which include the mount namespace. It was the first one to be introduced uh, in 2001. And uh, the way, from the naming of that particular namespace, it looked like people thought at that time that that was going to be the only namespace that was going to be introduced. Um, it's expanded since then, and uh, um, yeah. So the UTS namespace is the one that basically says, this is the host that you're running on, and uh, can also uh, provide uh, domain information. The IPC uh, namespace, as I've seen a few other people suggest, nobody really knows what this does, but it was introduced at a similar time. Um, I'm not sure whether anybody actually uses them now. Um, the net namespaces, those are a little bit easier to understand. Um, they're, again, they're peer uh, systems, or peer namespaces, so the system comes up in the initial peer na um, net namespace, and um, all of the physical devices appear in that namespace. So then if you want to have a new network namespace, you can unshare to go to that network namespace, and if you want to be able to use one of the physical names, uh, physical devices in that namespace, then you can uh, assign it from the initial namespace into that network namespace. And each uh, network namespace has its completely independent stack, so you can have its own firewalling and uh, devices, and they're completely isolated. If you want to get them talking to each other, then you can set up a virtual Ethernet pair between two namespaces and then treat it as another device and set up your rules and your firewall stacks and, and all the processes there. Um, in terms of hierarchies, there are three uh, namespaces that are set up as a hierarchy. So the, the permissions are inherited from one to another. Uh, the PID namespace was the first of those to be introduced. And the idea there is that in the initial PID namespace, you start at process one, and then in a uh, child namespace, you have uh, whatever PID uh, that process is that becomes the first process in your new uh, PID namespace, uh, has a PID of one in the new namespace, but it's got a PID of, I don't know, it could be 3,000 or something like that in your initial namespace. So it has representation in all of the parent namespaces um, and can be monitored as such. Um, peer uh, PID namespaces don't have any view into each other. So if you've got two ch children which are um, PID namespaces which are spawned from the same uh, namespace, PID namespace, then uh, each one is not able to see into its peers um, space. User namespaces are, uh, I guess, the most contentious one so far. Uh, there's a lot of security um, traps that um, are waiting to, well, not just waiting, some of them have already exposed themselves, but it's the most contentious in terms of how do we do security with user namespaces. And as a result, there are a number of um, uh, distributions that have not enabled user namespaces by default yet because there's still some work to be done to iron out where these are going. Um, in user namespaces, you can spawn, a, an unprivileged user will be able to spawn a user namespace, and then within that new namespace, they can map um, all the users within there back to uh, an existing user in the um, parent namespace. So in that user namespace, caught it. Um, <laughs> in that user namespace, uh, you can um, 
have a root user with a UID of zero, but it would map back to an unprivileged user in the parent namespace. Um, so that presents some issues about how much permission do you give that root within the user namespace. Um, yeah, so it can be very powerful, but it can also be a trap. So um, in terms of how audit relates to this stuff, I'll get to in a moment. C groups are the newest namespace which have just been introduced this spring. And uh, the point of that one is to hide memory limits. Oh, sorry, not just memory limits, but system limits of various different um, C groups. And uh, the problem before was that if you've got, uh, um, you're using C groups within a set of namespaces, uh, you're able to get an idea of what the system limits are. And the, the whole point of it is to hide them. I haven't been following the details of it, but I, uh, knew, I know enough that um, uh, it's here and uh, it's being accepted upstream and um, uh, things are being ironed out. Um, I wanted to say at the beginning, uh, if you've got questions, uh, by all means raise your hand and I'll try and address them in line. Um, I may simply defer to a later slide to answer the question or um, to discussion afterwards if it's, if it's getting too involved. So what are containers? Well, we don't really have a hard definition. Uh, there seem to be many definitions and as many, uh, almost as many as there are users. Um, there's sort of a general consensus that it's a combination of namespaces, kernel namespaces, um, secure computing, seccomp, and C groups. Uh, the kernel doesn't have any concept of what is a container. So at the moment, it's up to some uh, user space management tool to be able to say, this is a container and I'm managing it. Like, okay, cool. So what about the kernel? Um, it doesn't really know about these things and uh, it's user space that's, it's a concept that's completely in user space at the moment. At the moment. So, um, at, this point from the kernel's perspective, where there is some interest in uh, trying to um, uh, get a better sense of what is a container to be able to do the auditing so that uh, when an event happens, then you have a better idea of where this thing happened and what the context was and whatnot. So a couple of different potential directions that we can go there is to go with some kind of container ID that the uh, kernel knows about or to try and uh, track down all of the namespaces that are used in, um, in one particular uh, event uh, so that we can then trace back through other logs to say, okay, well, this set of namespaces was responsible for this action. So what is the problem? Well, to quote Highlander, there can only be one. At this point, um, there can only be one audit daemon and it has to live in the uh, initial user and PID namespace. And that's locked down by kernel rules that basically say it detects what namespaces you're in and simply uh, gives you an error if you try and run it. Um, so, so far with the mount, UTS and IPC namespaces, there's been no issues. Um, it's just uh, not a problem. Um, things were wide open until 3.7 RC1. Um, there were some, there was a limitation with network namespaces because it simply wasn't listening and it couldn't respond. Um, once the user namespaces came along, there was some necessity to start to lock things down because uh, of the sec obvious security implications of allowing this to happen. Um, the net namespaces, uh, that was fixed in 3.14. Um, there was an interest to be able to have, back up a second. So network namespaces have been used uh, by many network uh, appliances to be able to run thousands of different network namespaces. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, um, some kind of switch uh, where it needed, uh, or it was more convenient to be able to manage what was going on by compartmentalizing it into a number of different namespaces with their own uh, firewall stacks and um, uh, network uh, IPsec stacks and things like that. Um, and so 
there wasn't really any uh, good reason to restrict uh, which um, network namespace it was in and which uh, it was uh, needed to listen in. Um, the application for that was VSFTPD, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so uh, user namespaces, um, those as I've allude, alluded, there are some security concerns and um, there being, there's ongoing work to address this stuff. Um, Eric Biederman I've had a number of conversations with and uh, he's certainly familiar with the issues um, as are some of the other security guys and um, it has exposed some issues that have been in the mount name space since the very beginning, but they were not really abusable until we started adding other namespaces and other ways of being able to use them. So in terms of audit, um, the audit daemon, it seems to make the most sense to tie the audit daemon into the user namespace. Um, and I'll get to that a bit more in a moment. So in terms of the network namespaces, um, the initial network namespace was the, the one that was originally um, the one listening. Um, and there were a number of proposals on how to try and deal with it. And in the end, the least complex uh, solution won out for the moment, for the short term. Um, there were discussions of multiple queues and things like that and uh, ways to be able to, to say, okay, well, is this network namespace uh, socket equivalent to this other one over here. And uh, so for the short term, uh, we just put in a simple pa um, patch to be able to allow any network namespace to talk. Um, there were obviously other restrictions so that if it was in other uh, user or PID namespaces, it's, it wouldn't work anyway, but uh, at least the network stuff um, worked. So it, it broke existing containers uh, because the original assumptions were that the uh, system would refuse, sorry, would return uh, econ refused when it wasn't available because the protocol simply wasn't there. Yeah? Uh, just one so you're saying that clients cannot connect to send the audit messages to the kernel? Yes. So, yeah, to clarify there, um, this wasn't for configuration issues. This was uh, clients who were simply recording security information. Um, so, uh, all right. One of the, th one of the mechanisms that um, Audit has for determining whether or not you're allowed to run the daemon uh, is, I guess most people have assumed that root is all powerful on Unix systems and with capabilities uh, that um, is able to restrict these things and no longer give root all power. So there's th three capabilities right now. Um, cap audit control is what allows an audit daemon to actually have permission to be able to run in that, uh, in that space. Uh, cap audit write is the one that you're referring to, which actually allows user space daemons to be able to write a message to the audit log. Um, there is a third one, cap audit read, but uh, that's not germane for what we're talking about here. So in this particular case, in containers, uh, PAM, uh, when somebody was trying to log in in the container, PAM would then try and write a log message, a, an, an audit user message, uh, saying, hi, so-and-so logged in. When it tries to do that and it got back and econ refused, it would say, oh, audit's not configured, uh, just ignore it, I'm gonna just walk away. Um, but once we changed it so that in any network namespace, um, uh, the audit daemon was actually available, then it started returning eperm rather than econ refused. And since this was a subtle difference, then Pam got upset and just refused to log in altogether. So we had to kind of juggle things a bit, and so now we actually lie uh, and give econ refused when we're in that situation. So we're gonna have to go back and fix that at a later date. There was a bit of a, um, 
uh, I guess, a conflict. And uh, because it te technically broke user space, uh, only, even though the fact that user space was broken to start with, um, it changed the behavior, and uh, we all have a, well, many of us have a pretty good idea of how Linus feels about breaking user space. So, PID namespaces. Um, this was fixed, so the, the use case here was VSTPD auth, um, and again, like uh, PAM or login D, once a security event happens, then it wants to send this information to audit and say, hi, this event happened, you probably want to know about it, uh, you want to log it. So VSTPD broke in uh, some distributions, and so then it came through and say, okay, well, how are we gonna solve this problem? It's running in a PID namespace, um, which was completely restricted. Uh, PID and user namespaces, because of the hier hierarchical nature, we basically said, okay, well, that, that, that's not allowed to, to run. Um, but in this particular case, it seemed to make sense to be able to allow it, and we didn't see any danger in allowing cap audit write only in this particular case. So the, we had to do some cleanup in the code to be able to assure ourselves that any of the reports that were coming from non-initial PID namespaces uh, were able to go through okay, and the translation from its uh, PID namespace into a namespace that was at least well understood by the kernel was necessary. So because the audit daemon lives in the initial PID namespace, we simply translate it to the initial PID namespace and we store it in that, that way. Uh, there was a number of other reporting and whatnot that was done using the wrong uh, kernel uh, functions or macros, and those were cleaned up and fixed up, including parent PID. So uh, there's also an, some interfaces where uh, when there's some reporting necessary to do to user space, we want to make sure that when the time comes that we do have other tools in user space that can use cap audit control, that they will get the correct information instead of getting something that's based in a different namespace. So uh, looking ahead, um, once we do allow uh, cap audit control in PID namespaces, we're going to have to go back and um, um, fix a few things, but it, it shouldn't be too, too uh, difficult to deal. We, we, we have a pretty good idea and we understand the problem now. Now, uh, the user namespaces. Um, Gao Feng had submitted about four patches in 2013 to try and address this stuff. Um, he was also the one who was responsible for one of the uh, network uh, namespace patches that was a bit more complex than necessary. There are some ideas in his patches which will be helpful in the future, and so we'll be able to borrow some of those ideas and um, deal with the network namespace when that time comes. Um, the issues with his patch set for user namespaces, there were quite a number of questions that came up that weren't sufficiently answered, and uh, as was alluded in previous talk, um, there is uh, some good rigor from the community as to why are you doing this? What's your use case? And uh, have you thought about these different ways that things could be abused? And so there was some good discussion back and forth and it looked like things were just not quite ready for it yet. Um, notwithstanding the issues in the user names, the security issues in the user namespace. So there's also a audit namespace um, ideas were thrown around. There, were, there was never any code chucked around yet, uh, but in the discussion uh, that um, ensued from that, it started to become more and more clear that we didn't want to muck around with uh, yet another namespace and that it seemed like the most logical place to anchor audit was in the user namespace. Still requires cap audit control, and there's, it's not completely clear whether the, we need cap audit control in the initial namespace, or sorry, in the parent namespace that is spawning the user namespace, or somehow for it to end up with this in the user names, the new user namespace itself. 
Um, so it, there can only be one. That rule isn't entirely broken because now that rule applies per user namespace. Uh, well, not now, but in the planning that we're doing, in the direction that we're going. So another, a really important part of this is that we cannot have an audit daemon in a user namespace that's able to influence the audit daemon that's running on the initial namespace, which is the master one for the machine. Um, the best example that I can come up with is uh, the ability to panic the kernel. So if you've got things configured in a user namespace to panic the kernel, obviously it's gonna take down the entire machine, which is simply unacceptable. Um, it's been pointed out that people who are really care about security aren't going to be interested in running audit in namespaces, um, perhaps, but there's other use cases that have come up. And there are people who may be interested in some of these services of audit, um, but are quite willing to run containers. And a potential use case here is that rather than panicking the kernel, uh, audit D running in a, names, in a user namespace that detects some, some condition that it's unhappy with can simply kill off that user namespace and all its children. Um, there could be some interesting uh, ways to be able to use this. So uh, for each user namespace audit, each one would have its own rule space. And so if you've got a hierarchical um, namespace, such as the PID or user or C group namespace, um, if you've got some kind of rule that applies uh, in, your, um, in that particular namespace, if the rule exists also in the parent namespace, then it could trigger a similar type of message in both of the namespaces at the same time. Um, but you can set up your, name, your, your rules in your parent namespace such that it may not matter what's going on inside this user na namespace and you could avoid having things uh, DOS'd. Um, and then within your namespace, uh, you could actually run your audit daemon and have all the logs that you want and be able to monitor what's going on and, and, and be happy with that information. There's also the question of the queue. Uh, there was some discussion about where the queue should live and whether it should be a shared queue and whatnot. And the obvious one is that if you overflow the queue in a user namespace, well, in a, in a sub name, in a child namespace, then it could overflow the queue for the entire machine and that's simply unacceptable in terms of the influence of um, a audit in, an, in a container. So it looks pretty clear that we're gonna have to have a, our own queue in each, um, in each space. So, um, namespace IDs. Uh, within, the, within the kernel, um, there's an interest to, to be able to track what's going on in various different containers. We don't have any idea what is a container um, at this point in the kernel, and so there's two potential ways to approach this. The one, uh, one potential one, which was the one that was uh, first proposed by um, Aristo Rosansky of Red Hat um, three, four, three years ago, um, was he proposed using the proc uh, inode uh, to be able to track these. So there was some objection in the initial discussion that happened there, and uh, people reserved the right to be able to change the meaning of that particular uh, metric. And uh, it was felt that that information was incomplete without the, um, without the device ID. So I came along afterwards and proposed the serial number uh, on these things. So it was a monotonically in in incremented serial number uh, per kernel, and it would simply increment as um, uh, namespaces were created, and uh, that the intent there was to create something that uh, it couldn't be argued with uh, it um, uh, interfering um, with the, the usage of the proc inodes or potential change of uh, use of the proc inodes. Um, the proc part of it was eventually discarded because of the CRIU folks. Uh, the um, 
what do you call it, uh, backup and restore for containers. Um, that, yes, exactly, thank you. I couldn't remember the name. Um, so it was, uh, uh, it was removed from there, but still made available from the kernel's perspective um, for being able to do audit logging. Uh, the reason that the Kriu folks didn't like it is because if they're taking a, uh, backing up a container and moving it to another host, then if they try and restore it, then that particular uh, number is not something that they could restore on the new host, and it would show up as something different. So the, the process that was in it would be able to detect the fact that it had been moved to a different host. So that kind of stuff it wasn't, to be, um, wasn't to be exposed. Now that problem still exists with the proc inode, but that's their problem and I'm not gonna compound it. So the patch was also reworked um, for a namespace file system, uh, which came about about a year and a half ago. Um, Alvero um, pulled the namespace stuff off into its own file system and the device ID was added to it to be able to qualify any of the numbers that were uh, presented. So the idea here is that any events that happen, you've got a set of namespace IDs which are included with the event and uh, basically be done with it and uh, some user space uh, orchestration, uh, container orchestration tool would track those from the audit log messages and be able to sort of reassemble the picture afterwards and say, okay, this thing was created here, it had this, these set of namespace IDs and then it was moved over to here and it had this set of namespace IDs and at a higher layer it would map and track all of this stuff so that it could keep track of what was going on. The other potential way to go here is to use something called a container ID or the idea of a container ID um, and this would have to be added to the uh, task struct itself. Um, the idea is that uh, once you've got a container ID, then it's inherited by all of its children unless something says, oh, it's now part of a different container. So in this particular case, then you could use the event ID, sorry, you could use the container ID in various different events and be, the user space orchestration tool would then simply be able to track that container ID throughout its full life. Um, it would be inherited by all of its children, and the idea would be that, uh, I guess I, I was just reflecting on this um, within the last week, and it might actually make sense to do a capability to do that, something like cap container set, or something like that, and then a, um, a container orchestrator would have that particular capability to be able to set the container ID on a particular uh, process. And then uh, once it uh, had that, then it would automatically inherit down to all of its children. Yeah, when it gets migrated, when it gets migrated, it would have a different, um, actually, when it gets migrated, you could actually carry over the same container ID, except that there could be another container on the other host that's already got it. All right, punt, that's a user space problem. <laughs> Um, okay. <laughs> anyway, it's, yeah. 
again, that's a question of how the user space orchestration tool manages that resource. And it's simply, I guess, a helper so that the kernel is able to help the user space figure this out. Um, I should have gone back and uh, started with the first point on my slide here, is there's already a precedent for this, which is the session ID, and that was requested by the security folks to be able to track each login session. So somebody logs into a machine and they switch to a different user, they use sue or sudo or something like that, and they switch around and they do various different stuff. It all comes back to one initial uh, login, and uh, when that initial login is done, that's when the session ID is set, and so it's able to track all of the activity based on that original session ID. So there's already a precedent on, on using this type of mechanism, and again, the, the kernel itself doesn't inherently know anything about the session ID. This is something that's, uh, I guess, a user space concept, and the kernel is simply helping user space uh, in managing that information. Does that make sense? There was another question? No? Um, yeah, and, and again, in both cases, um, uh, the audit logs would be uh, aggregated by a orchestrator that um, is able to go across hosts. Um, because you could have more than one host that is hosting containers and you can migrate the containers between them and you want to be able to track the audit activity across both. So that's, that's a matter of uh, uh, developing more tools at a higher level to be able to securely um, uh, deal with this information. So, um, in conclusion, um, we're okay for uh, a number of the namespaces uh, and didn't have to do anything, fortunately, to, uh, to be able to manage them. Um, the net namespace is okay for now. Uh, we anticipate that uh, there are some changes that we'll need to make once uh, there are um, user namespaces in multiple audit daemons. In particular, uh, if you could have a user namespace and its host to more than one net namespace, and so it's a matter of getting all of those net namespaces within that, the, the scope of that one user namespace to all be able to talk to the, uh, the audit daemon. The PID, uh, PID namespace, uh, again, we're okay for now. We're able to receive um, audit user messages from any PID namespace as long as uh, that process is in the original, the initial user namespace. Um, we'll need tr uh, translation per PID and S, but uh, that's well reasonably understood. Um, so uh, the user day, sorry, the audit daemon, we're expecting to anchor it in the user namespace um, after some discussion and, um, and uh, exploration. And uh, we think we understand reasonably well uh, why that needs to happen, um, although there are still security concerns about user namespaces. Just to clarify, if you do that and a user namespace doesn't start from the daemon, it's still inherited from the daemon of the parent. It doesn't inherit the audit daemon. Well, but it inherits connections. No, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Um, it depends on the rules that are in place for that uh, initial, uh, uh, that parent namespace. So the parent namespace would have its own rule set in its queue, and if a user namespace doesn't choose to run an audit daemon, there isn't any reason to assume any of the information that's coming from that user, that child namespace. So it, the only reason we would care about it in the parent is if there's a violation or a, a trigger or a trip of a rule that's in that parent namespace, right? So if it's running in its own, I don't know, uh, mount namespace, and it does something bad to a file there, and we don't care about that namespace, mount namespace, who cares? Mm -hmm. 
not, not, well, the only reason we would care is if there was a violation of some kind of resource that they cared about in the parent namespace, like a file. But if it's a different mount namespace and it, doesn't, it isn't shared with that, uh, that uh, file system space by the parent, who cares? Right, right. So if there's, a rule, if there's a rule in the parent that says, I care about this file, and something happened to the file, then we'll log it. And the idea there is we want some more information about what that process was. And oh, we care about this file, it affected this particular um, file system in this uh, parent namespace, but the activity actually happened in this container over here, and here's the set of container IDs so that we know that it happened in this thing over here. So we would still want to log the spawning of new containers, but not necessarily log the, con the, con the activity that happens in it. Uh, that stuff would still be logged. But we, 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 therefore, we just inherit the parent label. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, I thought I saw another hand waving. No? All right. Um, where was I in my slide here? <laughs> right. So namespace IDs versus container IDs. Um, still have that decision ahead of us in terms of which way we want to go. I'm favoring the namespace IDs, but that ends up with eight IDs added to each uh, event record, which potentially, yeah, potentially. The thing is that the, at the moment with the IDs, we could simplify it so that it's down to a couple of digits and a hash could be significantly longer. So I'm not sure we really win anything there. And it's harder to read. Um, so yeah, namespace IDs, we're looking at seven namespaces plus the device ID, um, which could be relatively short integers. Right now, the offset on the, the uh, NSFS uh, inodes is something like, uh, um, I, don't, I think it's half of max int. So it's not particularly pretty. <laughs> um, now, so if we go to container IDs, then those, I guess, could be arbitrarily set by the uh, orchestrator orchestration management tool, or they could be assigned incrementally by just serially from boot. Um, in which case they would be relatively small, but I guess they could be large if you've got huge numbers of containers spawning and being killed off constantly. Uh, and again, the question of um, needing some orchestration tools, needing the, the I guess, the develop the higher level tools to be able to map and track all of the activity that's going on. So, any questions? Everybody happy? Yeah? You wouldn't inherit rules from the parent namespace. Once you start up a new audit daemon, you would uh, put in place the rules that you are interested in or care about. If parent if if um, if host B has somehow different policy um, in the namespace that is spawning the namespace, then that's up to the orchestration tool to manage that stuff. I don't know why the orchestrator would have a different set of rules, but it could. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, all right, any questions?
All right, so there we go. Um, I'm RGB at redhat.com. Um, the Lytix audit mailing list would be the place to be able to discuss this stuff. Once we start getting a bit more serious about it, then uh, there may be some spillover into the containers mailing list, and uh, there'll be certainly some stuff that shows up in LKML. Um, there's the URL to subscribe to the uh, mailing list. But if uh, there is any useful comments or patches or that kind of thing, uh, they, will, they will be accepted. They won't be uh, rejected if, they're, if they look reasonable to the list maintainer. Um, and upstream audit, um, we've recently migrated over to GitHub. And so all of our lin uh, audit stuff is in there. Um, there's sub-projects for the kernel for user space, which is still currently managed on Steve Grubb's um, SVN, um, but we're migrating over to GitHub soon. Uh, and then we've got a documentation um, repository as well as a test suite uh, repository. So there it is.